Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, in the next uh, half an hour, uh, Christoph Weibel and myself will uh, present to you a few of our uh, recent research findings that we uh, could gain through our uh, ongoing uh, FCL global module, Powering the City, that is uh, led by Professor Arno Schwitter here. And uh, we would like to uh, focus on how to use uh, more data-driven approaches to uh, optimize uh, the use or the deployment of photovoltaics in cities. <clears throat> and so um, it's not only data itself, but also that we gain a better understanding of how people make use of cities uh, that we want to harness to improve the uh, deployment of photovoltaics. And so this is coming in through the urban science approaches. And before we go into the tec technical details, just a little bit of broader uh, motivation perhaps why we are why we need new science approaches maybe i can get rid of this one now <clears throat> and so why do we need new approaches more scientific approaches also so uh, just to give you a broad motivation that uh, cities are facing a growing list of grand challenges uh, most importantly cities are growing uh, worldwide. That gives a lot of pressure onto the existing uh, infrastructure networks um, that may lead also to city fragmentation, social segregation problems and so on. So there's a lot of socio-technical issues going on. Um, at the same time, we have to deal with climate change. So we have to try to uh, both uh, um, mitigate and uh, climate change and uh, reduce the impacts of that. Like urban heat island effects. We have many other uh, issues, including most recently the pandemics. And so bottom line is that we really need to design urban infrastructures that are people-centric, that really support the functioning of cities, that really support the socioeconomic workings. And these infrastructures also need to be efficient, resilient, and ideally decarbonized. <clears throat> and to do so, we can uh, now make use of, a, of the increasing availability of large scale data of how people actually make use of urban space, which uh, consists of mobile phone records, social network data, points of interest data. So there's a, an increasing wealth of data available that we can use to better understand how cities actually function. So there's not only data, but we also have uh, new data analytics uh, approaches that have been developed in tandem with this increasing availability of data that range from data mining techniques and uh, novel machine learning approaches, of course, that we could use. And at the same time, there has been uh, almost like a new science of cities uh, evolving over the, the past years, coming more from the uh, physics side uh, where people applied scaling theory, uh, network theory is a prominent example of that, that we can understand how people connect to each other in cities, spatial interaction models that predict flows in cities and so on. And the goal here of these science approaches, I think that's very important, is to reveal fundamental irregularities in how cities actually function. And so we can then combine <laughs> these insights that we gain from such a urban science approach with more traditional infrastructure engineering. And in that way, we can increase the efficiency of urban infrastructures. So that was just a very gener general high level approach. And now we delve into the actual photovoltaics, which is one form of urban infrastructure. And I'm actually starting right now with um, using vehicle to grid uh, approaches to further deploy photovoltaics in cities. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the vehicle to grid concept. It's not the new idea, it's a quite an old idea actually. It's the idea that electric vehicles carry a battery and you can basically, first of all, charge this battery uh, through uh, with photovoltaics, so with, with solar energy. 
You can then store this energy in the vehicles so that basically vehicles act as decentralized energy storage devices. And then when uh, there's no sunlight available in the uh, evening hours and the night, night hours, you can then uh, plug your vehicle back to the grid and you can discharge uh, your battery and you can feed the energy stored in the battery back to your home. So it's basically a way, uh, um, I would say, you, 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 it's a way to bring your, the sunlight back home in the night hours. And so <laughs> this idea has been around, but it's, it's gaining more traction right now. And there are uh, two main drivers. So first of all, the, uh, there, there's now a really uh, almost like a boom in, uh, in the use of global electric vehicles. So the market share tripled since 2019, according to the International Energy Agency. At the same time, the global photo photovoltaics power generation also is increasing quite rapidly at the moment, at least globally. Uh, so only in 2020, uh, it increased by about 23%, according to the IEA again. And so again, so this vehicle to grid or V2G and then can really then be used and can be really deployed in a, in a larger scale through this two uh, development uh, uh, that use uh, electric vehicles uh, as distributed energy storages. And this helps then to balance out the uh, intermittent availability of, uh, of uh, power generated by photovoltaics. And um, there are papers, or there is some work, and there is literature on this, of course, of this combination between PV and EV. And one study, for instance, found, it's for Japan, for uh, Kyoto, I believe, that this combination of photovoltaics and EV may cut urban CO2 emissions quite drastically by 60 to 74%. Existing studies on, on EV charging and the coupling to uh, photovoltaics, they are usually based on quite simplified assumptions. So for instance, they assume that people uh, either uh, charge or discharge their vehicle either at home or at work, just because uh, there's no much, not much data around also to understand how people actually move. And so all non-work related trips are actually missed. And so I think that's, that's really a gap basically that should be filled because also, especially here also in Singapore where it gets dark quite early, like at around, uh, I don't know when, when PV is not uh, available anymore in the evening hours, maybe at six, six around six-ish PM, maybe even earlier, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, solar irradiance goes down. So um, <laughs> of, after this early evening hours, people are of course still, active and they go somewhere, they're not going straight home, uh, especially also uh, now due to the uh, to, to changes after the pandemics that people are not necessarily, go, do not necessarily go to the office every day. So they might go uh, somewhere else, they might go to the shopping mall, to the park, uh, to the gym for dinner and so on. And so all these uh, locations and trajectories and stay locations, they basically offer an opportunity to further, um, to either charge, discharge the car and thus to further optimize the whole vehicle to grid uh, system so as to maximize the uh, deployment of PV basically the city. Yes. Okay, and so this is the, the idea we had. So, and back to the story at the beginning, we have now, more data available and the prominent example is uh, mobile phone data, anonymized mobile phone data. Uh, ideally it's trajectory data, it looks quite simple. It, it's nothing very complicated. Uh, so basically it's a, it's a table that is usually kept by the data providers in-house due to privacy reasons. It has a user ID, a timestamp and then a tower ID. So the spatial granularity is given by the uh, mobile phone towers. And then usually also have a, a longitude latitude, the geographic coordinates for those mobile phone towers. And then you can translate this 
table basically into trajectories in space for, for the individuals with some, uh, at, at least at some spatial and uh, temporal resolution. Yeah. And so, um, so we did the first um, initial or preliminary study within our uh, project. And uh, if you're interested, it's, it's, it's online, it's, it's a preprint on archive. And the idea here is that we use those uh, trajectories from the individuals and we couple them with a EV charging and discharging behavior, right? So the idea is that we forget about all the existing charging and infrastructure, charging and discharging infrastructure, and we actually just look how people move through the city and where they stop and, 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 and on the aggregate at least. And that we use this information as a basis for where to put charging and discharging station and how we can optimize the uh, uh, charging and discharging behavior also. So that's the whole idea that we start from the, from the um, human mobility behavior in the city and then on top of that, we build the infrastructure. And so, uh, can I use this one? Yeah. Okay, so, so basically here we would have a trajectory again, basically similar as the one we have seen before from the mobile phone data. So we, this is just a schematic. So we would have an individual uh, would live at location A, would start out in the morning, 7.15, go to location B, uh, stay there until early afternoon, then go to location C. So this could be, for instance, the working location and go to a shopping mall, for instance, or to a park and then go to yet another location D, which could be a restaurant and then go home again. And so what we do is on top of this trajectory, uh, we put a, a char simple charging and discharging scheme that would uh, maximize the use of solar energy. So we give a very simple rule. And this is now, this, the whole idea is just to, to show or to further explore the potential of the active grid for photovoltaics. So we would assume that during uh, night hours when it's dark, uh, or when this, at least when the solar irradiance is quite low, uh, which would be until 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, people would rather like to discharge their battery, right? So as to support the photovoltaics. And then when, it's, when the sun comes up and the irradiance is sufficiently high, people would charge their battery. So wherever they are, whenever you make a stop for at least one hour, that's the assumption, uh, people would charge during the, 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 during the day until the battery. So here on the y-axis, we have the battery state of charge. So if one is fully charged. So whenever they stop and whenever it's daytime, they will charge their battery until it's full. And when they move, they, of course, we have some uh, battery depletion here, which is here indicated by these jumps. And then when the sun or when the solar irradiance is, is low, then people would start to discharge their batteries, right? So this is just a, a, a very simple scheme, maybe it's a naive scheme even to, uh, to optimize the use of, uh, of solar energy. And so we do this whole thing, we do this not only for one individual, but we do it for, for tens of thousands of them that we have in the database, uh, I will just show you. And we basically um, aggregate all this charging behavior and we can then basically map how much energy can be discharged into the individual regions in Singapore. So this is the result. So basically uh, here on the left, <coughs> This is a result basically that shows how much energy can be provided through this vehicle to grid to the different areas in Singapore during nighttime. So basically that's the energy collected through solar energy during the day and then released during the night hours into the different areas and um, when it's dark. And so the uh, point here is that the uh, variation is quite large. 
because it's a very simple uh, charging and discharging scheme. So we can see that, especially like in downtown, in the downtown area or uh, here, uh, we have a lot of energy that's being released because people really concentrate there also in the um, in those early evening hours. And uh, with this scheme, that's basically show, um, yeah. So we we basically compare these numbers to the uh, annual energy household consumption, electricity consumption for each household. And um, what we can see here in this histogram is that it also uh, fluctuates quite large. So the uh, local energy coverage through such a vehicle to grid scheme. Uh, fluctuates between about five and forty percent in different uh, areas in the city, so it's quite quite large differences. That's one, and then the second one is also that we can um, not only look at the discharge or the energy provision, but also at the at the peak demand. Uh, so because on, with this simple scheme, uh, uh, people would try to charge their car uh, at the same time as soon as they as soon as the battery is low and we can again see that in the downtown area here uh, the peak demand is is quite high it's about 24 watts per square meter under this simple scenario assumption and if we compare so that's the peak demand for charging and if we compare this with the uh, power generation from photovoltaics, a simple estimate of photovoltaic power generation per area that takes into account the built up area, uh, we would get about 20 watts per square meter, which is lower than the peak demand. And secondly, also, if we then factor in the, um, the charging of the, car, of the cars, uh, the duration it takes, uh, we can estimate how many charging stations we would actually need, and that would we will get a very high number, which is about 3,000 uh, charging points per square kilometer. And so this is um, somehow also contradicts current efforts to uh, to make cities car light. Also, actually, so this is not actually what we really necessarily want. And so these numbers just show that there's a, a clear need for more uh, smart uh, charging scheme in terms of that, that we would need a more coordinated efforts of where and when people charge and discharge their cars so as to uh, further uh, even out those strong differences and to reduce the need for charging infrastructure and also reduce the need uh, for cars actually in different different areas yeah so i hope you uh, get here the idea and um, there, there's a lot uh, to do of course and so what we are working right now is, is one point is really to to couple uh, to, to couple um, this analysis also with uh, future mobility scenarios that we want to um, also extend it to public transport, um, <clears throat> maybe even to autonomous vehicles. So we would need more realistic future scenarios of how people move around, or which uh, 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 mode they actually use in moving around the city. Uh, there's a, a clear, uh, one step is clearly that we need to now to apply uh, optimization methods, really. So really to, to, uh, to further maximize uh, the use of solar light, uh, solar energy. So where to place charging and discharging points in the city. And then one interesting point is also to, um, to develop more smart charging, discharging schemes. So really to incentivize uh, through a pricing scheme where and when to charge and discharge their vehicles. And uh, last but not least, also when we, we come more from the solar energy side there's a clear need also that we need to have more realistic and more detailed uh, solar uh, energy models uh, for the city and i think that hopefully bridges to christoph's <laughs> presentation yes this bridges it very nicely <laughs> okay thank so. you here we go
Dante Fritsch in the So, um, yes, how this connects now to um, a bit of uh, the work that um, we've been doing in Arnold's chair is, of course, um, I hope it's possible. you might be familiar with um, the concept of multi-energy systems and smart energy grids, where it's all about connecting different energy carriers with electricity. It's not only electricity, it's also other energy streams and energy carriers, and also you will find uh, mobility as part of it. And um, that's really how, how our work connects to this um, quite nicely. You um, might have seen similar graphs like this. This one shows a dispatch, an optimized um, electrical dispatch for a typical day for an energy system. And um, while this one does not contain mobility, um, it more or less conceptually is, is the same. So you would know your demands. And of course, you're looking at an optimized dispatch to reduce costs and emissions of the system. And using such information, you could also actually um, select and size the capacities and the energy technologies and the storage technologies. And in next steps, we're um, working on that and connecting Marcus models um, to also work on these optimization models. Now, this is also fairly probably known to the FRS crowd upstairs, but you might be aware of the many uncertainties that there are with solar energy. And um, this causes a lot of um, perturbation, intermittency, randomness. Um, but also in load as demand or in, in demand um, curves, it's of course, not, nothing is deterministic, it's all highly uncertain. And with the model that I'm going to present you here, it's, um, we're tackling the solar side, not, not really the, the demand side, but we are proposing a solar model that can take into account um, or that actually generates stochastic profiles and not only de deterministic profiles. And why that matters, um, we have uh, from an older study we have um, run an optimization for the Swiss uh, district to size also PV on the facades. And the question is, using these optimization algorithms, where does it make sense to place photovoltaic on these buildings? And that's what this um, image shows. So on one, one axis, you have all the different building surfaces. We have like 150 or so, um, and then split into four sub patches. And everywhere where you see a red, uh, uh, but blob, uh, it means that PV has been put on this facade patch. So this is optimal. And this one would assume stochastic profiles. Now, if we use actually stochastic profiles, so um, here we used 40 different stochastic profiles, you would find that there should be hopefully an overlap between the deterministic case and the stochastic case, but there's a lot of differences too. And this just clearly shows that, um, yeah, there's a saying uncertainty is the new normal. So I think everyone who um, has been doing a bit of building simulation knows that this is certainly the, the way to go. And that's the reason why we now want to move away a little bit from the physics, purely physics-based solar models to propose something that can at least capture this to a certain extent. Okay, I think it's loading. In solar modeling, that's um, what you're probably aware of, um, the, the physics-based approach you require the full um, scene, you, you require full knowledge of um, the urban environment, like the whole 3D model, the, the climatological information. And then you do your physics calculations, your ray tracing and so on. And then you only get um, one profile logically for, for the points that you've simulated. Now, what we are doing is, um, and that's gonna be a little bit of a full graph, but let's go over it bit by bit. We are calling it solar gun or it stands for generative adversarial networks, which is um, a type of um, machine learning model, generative machine learning model. Um, and the only input that we really need to generate a whole ensemble of stochastic profiles is really only one fisheye image. And there has been actually quite a lot of work specifically on, on rooftop, um, also here at NUS, there's quite impressive work um, from various groups. But um, the facade aspect has been a little bit untouched so far. And, and that's for a number of reasons, complex shading situations and um, less available information actually. But uh, this model is specifically tailored to facade points. 
So the only thing that we really need is this fisheye image from a facade point. And going through this whole pipeline, we create an ensemble of profiles. Um, maybe just very briefly, we can discuss this in detail if you're interested later. Um, but just to get an idea what steps are involved and necessary, you do need to segment that image. So uh, we need to know from that fisheye what is ground, what are windows, what is um, opaque surfaces, and what's the sky. So currently we only have these four categories. But after the segmentation, yeah, we also enroll it in, into this shape. But after the um, categorization, we put it into an image encoder. And um, we're using beta VAE, so variational autoencoders here, to transfer this with, um, of course, using um, CNNs into, into the latent space. And this encoded um, information we actually use and feed it into a conditional time series generator. So there's a different model ar architecture here because in the end we wanted to create um, time series and not, not yet another image. And the classical approach using these things is usually you, you throw in an image, you distort it somehow, and then another image gets out. But yeah, we are really looking at creating time series, of course. Furthermore, we are feeding other supplemental information into this um, conditional time series generator such as um, height and orientation and uh, weather statistics. And this information is all, yeah, if, if, you, if you know your fish eye point, then you know this information also, of course, inherently. Now let's have a look at <laughs> what the results are. We are only generating weekly time series because it was impossible to generate the whole year in one bit. So what the model actually does is it creates uh, weeks of um, hourly time series. And um, one of the inputs is also, it knows which month we want to generate the, um, the time series for. So in the end, we just stack all the weeks together and um, end up with the whole year. And it works fairly okay. So you can see um, the ground truth here in, in green and then the ensemble in, in light uh, red. And um, most of the trends are pretty okay-ish captured. And of course, there's a little bit of a deviation. Um, but yeah, already here you can see that it's, it, there's quite a good match. Looking a bit closer into the, the statistics, um, we look, by the way, we look into Singapore and uh, Zurich, um, and we train it for different cities um, with the same climate around um, in this area and in the, um, around the Swiss area. That what we find is that, um, yeah, the JSC is the Jensen Channing um, divergence. So it measures basically quality of um, your prediction or it, it measures the difference of the ground truth to what we are generating. And um, yeah, something around um, lower than 0 0.1 would be considered good. And what we can see, but also graphically, is that looking at the statistics, um, for example, here in the hourly distribution, it works fairly okay, fairly, fairly well, especially in Zurich, it, it looks actually really good. Um, and in the annual distribution, it looks a little bit less, less good. But um, these are challenges that we also maybe want to tackle then in future developments. Um, yeah. Looking more into the time series on um, different days, some different day profiles. These are the, all the days on average through, through the whole year, basically. So that's why yeah, you can clearly see in Singapore. Um, so we're looking at still at facades. That's why the irradiation or the irradiance drops during noon because we're on the facade. And in Zurich, yeah, you have this nice peak during noon, of course. But um, looking at the, the whole averages of the whole, of the whole year, you can again clearly see that there's a little bit of a mismatch between what we are generating and between what the ground truth is. But overall, especially actually in the, in the European case, we are quite happy with, um, with the results that we could um, obtain with this model. Right. Now talking a bit about computational time. So of course you could ask, yeah, there are physics. Why do we need to slap yet again machine learning on something? Is it just a trend that we're following? No, of course not. Um, we can, have, so climate studio, we consider as the fastest current model available. Um, maybe there's something faster again, but climate studio is what we found the fastest solar model. And if we compare it to this program, um, our pipeline, um, it's, uh, includes a couple of uh, necessary steps involved, but it's about a factor of 3.5 faster than Climate Studio. But Climate Studio only generates one profile, and we can generate actually here we created 40 profiles. 
at the same time. So it's much faster and we get our stochastic profiles. For transparency reason, there is a bit of a bottleneck um, on the bottom left, and that's to capture the fisheye image from Climate Studio, which takes right now 60 seconds just to make one snapshot. But um, yeah, we argue that just because it's Climate Studio and we don't need to make a proper rendering, we actually have um, our Hive tool that we use in teaching and the shading mask, yeah, you can see. It's nothing com uh, com complicated to do. So considering all that, we can say that our model is about 3.5 times faster than Climate Studio currently. All right, um, yeah, the, the big potential of this is, of course, in principle, we could use any fisheye image. We could use photographs and just um, segment them into these categories. And in principle, these things could be fed into the model because in the end, what we, all, all we need is a segmented fisheye image and then we can put it into the model. But the huge potential is, of course, that um, yeah, no, no, not a lot of information is required anymore. We really just need need these images to produce results. And um, to show you some, some of these generative cap capabilities of this model. So originally we were actually only interested in time series generation, but in the course of the development, we found that there's actually, actually a huge of nice things that using these model architectures that we, that we, um, that we um, can exploit, there's a huge generative capability. So what you can see here is that um, coming from one uh, fisheye image that we, we um, capture, from a 3D model or wherever. Uh, after the whole pipeline, what we can actually do is alter the, the, the feature space or the, um, it's, it's the latent space um, and alter some of these parameters um, generatively. And uh, for example, on top, you see, um, you see the window to wall ratio. So these are not points interpolated from existing data. It's um, really all purely generated. It's not, it's not interpolation from existing data. Um, and you can see in real time accordingly how the profiles change um, based on these um, altering um, uh, urban features. And not only things like window to wall ratio, we can actually move the whole camera in space. And again, these are not interpolated points. We do not have a point on top and a point at the bottom. We only have one point here and the rest is, uh, is generated out of, out, of, out of air. It's pretty cool. And you can see how these profiles change accordingly. So of course, this is where we are currently, and we, it's, it's um, all in preparation for, we, we're aiming to put this onto archive next week or so. Um, and we also have a conference paper that's been accepted. But I would like to also spend one, two minutes on, on the further outlook, because this is a huge and very dynamic field with a lot of recent amazing progress. And of course, or maybe you have seen things like that, um, these generative um, images and even in dynamic um, images. This one actually only shows um, segmentation, real time segmentation of urban landscapes, but there are also methods that can generate whole renderings out of, out of segmented um, images. And yes, I would like to actually uh, mention one of the recent work from um, those um, people are all here, so you can go talk to them later. Um, a master thesis from um, Max, um, who has looked into Zurich and the, um, the surfaces that are, that are actually available or the, the spaces that are available in the city besides buildings. So if we look into green spaces and the bus stations, and here we come again to, to coupling with um, public transportation and um, mobility and vehicle to grid technologies, um, there's actually huge uh, potential to utilize PV besides buildings and rooftops. And um, this one is, of course, we've learned over the past couple of days here in Singapore that it it's a lot about convincing stakeholders, convincing or finding solutions that work, that work from an urban point of view. And we are not just engineers, we want to make a good city. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to just say, we want beautiful solar panels with zero eco impact and that give us shade on a play field. Or if we could throw in a word saying, we want to put PV on all the bus stops or on, on a bus stop at Marina Bay designed in a certain way. Or if we could say, we want this HDB building to be fully covered in PV um, on the roofs and facades, and it should be safe and secure, and of course, cost efficient. Well, if you have been following a little bit the media, the past couple of days have been very exciting for machine learning uh, enthusiasts. That actually already exists. So this person put in futuristic flooded Copenhagen, just as search term or as, as term as a text input. And using the, such models, 
the whole image has been created. So that's not a single pen stroke has been done manually. This is based purely on these generated methods. Or treehouse mist architecture, 3D, 8K resolution, detailed painting, digital illustration, steampunk. Even that image, <laughs> boom, out. And uh, as a last example, Kowloon City in the style of Wes Anderson. So you can really specify things in, this, in these, um, these, um, these new models. And out comes a pretty impressive, from a distance at least, looking really realistic and highly visual image. And this is a little bit of the vision that, um, that I'm thinking of, that combining all these, these really huge advancements in machine learning and generative methods and putting more engineering into it, because this one is just art. It's in the end fake and synthetic. We can't use this to build real cities, of course. But I can, yeah, I believe that give it a couple more years and really amazing things come out of it. And of course, that's also where real data, such as um, Marcus' team is using, is highly important. Um, and putting a lot of engineering knowledge into it is also important. That it's just not um, dream castles, but of course, useful for for urban planning, and that would conclude the talk. I think we're open for questions now. Thanks.